introduce Patricia and Crystal, two of our graduate student consultants at the University Writing Center. Together, the three of us will talk you through various topics today related to scholarly writing, including the expectations for writing in graduate school, some information on research and outlining, information on plagiarism, and scholarly expectations. So if you have questions at any time, please feel free to stop and ask. Anybody have questions right now? Okay. We will also refer to the handouts that you've gotten at certain stages, so we will let you know about the information on those. All right, so scholarly writing. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is paper length. Okay, so for a minute, just imagine this scenario. You're in your first graduate school class, or you're in a graduate class you've taken before, and you have a mix of undergraduate student and graduate student, and your professor is talking about the end of semester paper, and she says that undergrad students will have to write a paper about eight to ten pages. Okay, that doesn't seem too bad. And then she says, graduate students will have to write a paper about conference length, which is about 15 to 20 pages. So why do you think graduate students have to write so much more? Who in here had had to write a lot for their class as a graduate student? Raise your hand. Okay, does anybody have an idea why? Anybody? <laughs> Uh, first. Me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just show your ability to, you know, do your research and apply, you know, creative mentality in oh. a word form. So. Yeah, that's good. Um, mm -hmm. Right, you're being asked to cover a subject or a uh, great semester, yeah. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> a word may be used for, like I said, dissertations or, or with other students to get access to it, so kind of high expectations with it. Yeah. Anybody? Uh, at the undergraduate level, you're mostly doing a survey, whereas at the graduate level, you're, expect, you're entering into the professional realm. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, those are all really good. Um, one thing I've learned as a graduate student is you're kind of supposed to know how to research and write well, so they push you harder. So as a graduate student, you all kind of get good ideas why you have to write more. So these are kind of three basic things you should know when you're writing papers. So you will write more, as we talked about. You may be given a, a range, so a minimum or a maximum. And you'll not always be told how much to write. So for this latter point, you might be given an uh, assignment and everything to include in the assignment, but you kind of have to figure out your own paper length. And that's just a more of a responsibility that you have as a graduate student. So another thing about scholarly writing is sometimes you'll have to make argumentative papers. So the first type of argumentative paper is a uh, design decisions argumentative paper. So, thanks. Okay, so for one of my classes, technical editing, I had to create this brochure. And as you can see, I made choices in color, font, spacing, proximity, pictures. But as a graduate student, you can't just make these choices and say they're right. You have to have an accompanying paper with it, such as a defense paper, explaining why you made these choices. So for color, one of the things I would have to say is I chose the colors blue and orange because the complementary color scheme is successful because the hues, saturation, brightness, and temperature, orange and blue, have strong color contrast. And then I would cite Kim Ball and Hawkins' document design 265. So I had to take a document design textbook in my class and use that as a source and use that throughout or use articles that I read in that class. And it just makes you more convincing and it helps you in your workplace to how to kind of frame those arguments. 
Okay. And now Patricia will talk about research paper arguments. So when you're writing a research paper, you will typically have two different types of styles. One is argumentative and the other is analytical. So for argumentative papers, you are trying to persuade your audience of some idea, and these type of papers typically use a thesis to do so. For example, if you're writing a paper on abortion, you would try to persuade your audience about your particular stance and why that stance is valid. And um, also in this type of paper, you should always back up your argument with information. So um, scholarly articles or textbooks or books in general, you want to make your point and then back it up with what other people have to say in the field. Then you also have analytical papers, and these are more exploratory and evaluative. And um, this typically does not include a thesis statement, but rather a research question. So this is kind of what you would think of your typical research paper in the sense that you would um, want to explore a certain field. And in the literature review, you would delve into what has been done in the field, what needs to be done, and then evaluate where you can go from there. So next we're going to talk about critical thinking papers, or just critical thinking and proposals. So critical thinking is a part of graduate school. It's a part of everything we do in graduate school. And we just have a couple questions to get you thinking about this. How have you employed critical thinking in the past? And how do you think you will use critical thinking in graduate school? Do you have any examples of how you've used it in the past? Um, critical thinking can be kind of how you solved a problem or how you convince somebody of something. So has anybody done something like that? One particular example might be if you are reading a, a research document and you're evaluating their methods and um, how they wrote that particular article, you're being critical and you're thinking analytically. Yes? Yeah, sure. Uh, an example would be like you're taking an aesthetics, taking aesthetics courses, um, arguing different types of aesthetics and literature or music. Yeah, that's a great example. Do we have any ideas about how we may use critical thinking in the future? Um, to rephrase that, how would you use critical thinking for your job? Yeah. Well, I had my, I did my undergrad back in 07. And then I went out to business world, opened a business, did pretty good, and then I sold my shares and came back here. But while I was in industry, I found problems, you know? So I could think critically against them. You know, I'm not trying to be problem focused, but I could, you know, ultimately become solution focused. And yeah. come to grad school, you know, and then start writing on my problems, i.e. My, my thesis. So okay. I, that's just the way I would think critically, looking at the problems and, you know, using what concepts I have. Yeah, that's very simple. Can you? I've been sales. I mean, every time somebody tells me they don't want to use the product that I sell, I have to do some type of argument to persuade them they do to overcome the objections. Yeah, has anybody um, who's a graduate student found something they learned in their class and learned how to apply that to their work? Oh, uh, well, I took a statistics course or it's a uh, experimental design, and I use that I try to use it extensively in my part of my defense of my thesis. That's great. That's a great example. Um, I'm in marriage and family therapy as, them, as well as some of my peers, and we often learn about the theoretical basis for therapy, but then it's our role to take that theory and apply it, apply it to our therapeutic session, session. So that would be one way that you would take something as abstract as theory, but then apply it to your real world interaction. Yeah. Okay, so next, the fourth type of scholarly writing is proposals. And Patricia will tell you the difference between a qualitative and quantitative research. So I personally struggled with the, the two different types in undergrad. And I thought the easiest mm -hmm. way to remember them were to um, break down the parts of the word. So with qualitative, you're doing, it sounds like quality. So you want to think of um, delving more deeply into your subject and bringing up more rich information. Whereas with quantitative, 
sounds like quantity, so numbers, you're looking for numbers. So this may be um, maybe satisfaction scores or the number of individuals that participate in some kind of treatment or that, that kind of thing. Okay, so to help you kind of understand this more, I'm going to tell you how to do a qualitative research proposal. So a uh, qualitative research proposal is really, the good thing about them is that they're brief, so they can be about two paragraphs long. So how do you get here? Well, we've broken it down, we've broken it down for you into steps. So the four <coughs> steps to creating your first paragraph. The first step is to start with a topic that relates to your major. I'm a technical and professional communication major, which is kind of a division of English. And so my major is technical communication, and technical communicators edit. So I chose a problem with how writers respond <coughs> to editing comments. The second step is to find sources on your topic to figure out the problem. So when I did my research, I read sources on the topic and found out that there were two problems that researchers become frustrated with comments that suggest changes, and that writers' written comments are not always clear to writers. So the third step is to include what research has been done on the topic. So after I read my research, I found out that other researchers have analyzed comments written by peer reviewers and instructors. So the fourth step is to finish that paragraph by briefly explaining what is missing from the research, what it has to be in research. And after I did that, I found out that verbal comments was very limited on this topic. So after you do this first paragraph, your second paragraph is three steps. So start with your research question, what you want to find out for this topic, and who or what you're going to observe slash analyze. So what I found out was, what I wanted to find out was what type of verbal comments written writing consultants give, and how students react to these verbal comments. And so I'd be observing writing consultants and students. So the second step is explain how you plan to answer this question. What type of qualitative research you'll be doing, and what your part in the research will be. So here I found, out, um, here I wrote that my qualitative research would be a case study, and a basic explanation of case study is going into that environment you're going to study and watching people in their natural habitat. And my part in the research was I will be observing sessions between students and consultants, and I will be doing interviews with consultants later on. So the third step is to finish with your potential literature review article. So everything that you've read so far on your topic, you should include here. And the last thing is, <coughs> The last thing is you take these two paragraphs and you combine them, and there's your paper. So that's um, how you would form a qualitative research proposal, but you can also do a quantitative research proposal. So the example provided is one that I personally used um, during my undergrad when I was doing an honors thesis. And the major difference between a quantitative and a qualitative is that with a quantitative, you are um, the methods are a little bit different. So when you're doing a quantitative, you tend to go more into depth about the specific measures you're using, how you intend to measure whatever variable you are interested in. So for example, I included uh, one of my research questions and then described that I was using a Likert scale and showed the different answer choices available. And um, this, I, in my opinion, this is the biggest difference between quantitative and qualitative is really how you explain the method. Um, otherwise, you are going to still include some information about research, what has been done, what needs to be conducted, what influenced your project, why your project is important, what it could contribute to the larger academic community, and then you're going to want to finish with a more specific description of how you intend on running that study. So are there any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about qualitative uh, 
research proposal, you were mentioning the comments section. And I was wondering, when you said comments, were you referring to a research paper or were you referring to some other source uh, as far as gathering your ideas? Oh, okay, so a proposal comes before your actual paper. Mm -hmm. This is something that you'll write for your professor to show that you've chosen a topic and that you're ready to do the research. Mm -hmm. So it's before you've even begun doing the research. And a lot of times these are really important when you're um, applying to the IRB. They want to see what you intend on doing, why is this important, that kind of information before they're going to just allow you to conduct a study. And one thing I learned that's really important is when you're doing quantitative research, if you don't know how you're going to analyze and you don't know how you're going to break down that analyze, you're not going to be able to do the research. You're going to get stuck. So this is very important. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So now Patricia. So now Patricia will talk about scholarly style. Okay. So before you begin writing, there are a couple of questions that you may want to consider. Um, I personally think that sitting for a moment and thinking before you write anything on the page can be really helpful because it allows you some time to organize your thoughts. And um, these particular questions I found particularly helpful. And I believe that they are listed on the blue handout so that you can refer to these in the future. Uh, these questions were taken from Purdue OWL, which if you have never used Purdue OWL, it's a great resource. It can help you with tips for writing, as well as um, tell you how to cite for APA, MLA, Chicago, the different uh, formats. And anytime you have a writing question, just go ahead and refer to them. They even have um, the research process broken down, how to write different types of papers. I, I think they're really a valuable resource, and they're free, and they're online. You can access them anytime. But um, as you can see, you definitely want to consider your audience when you, before you are writing. Because your audience really can influence what you write and how you write it. If your audience is your professor, that may be one thing. Whereas if your audience is a scholarly journal, that may be, you know, you may want to write more formally and be more concise in that situation. And those questions as well are on the blue made out. So when you organize a research article, you typically want to organize it in this way. This is also included on the back of the handout. And it's very important to use headings and subheadings, especially in a lengthy document. Otherwise, it be can become tedious for the reader, and they may decide to put your writing aside and not read it, honestly. So um, these headings are, I found to be particularly helpful. And their title page, abstract, introduction, literature review, methods, results, discussion, and then you'll include an appendix of references. And just for your personal information, we've included um, what, very generally, what should be in each of those subjects. And then you also want to make sure that you are using a formal and confident tone in your writing. So in terms of a formal tone, you will want to avoid using first and second Person. So this also will differ depending on whether or not you're using quantitative and qualitative. In quantitative, they definitely shy away from using first and second person, whereas in qualitative, there's more of a, a, a growing confidence and a, a growing comfort with using first person, depending upon what your study is and how you want to represent that study. In terms of confidence tone, you want to use the active voice versus the passive voice. And you want to avoid presenting questions. You want to be confident and show that you understand what you're talking about and you have a firm, firm grasp on it, with the exception of research questions that are um, a, a large portion of the paper. You also want to avoid using vague words. And in order to do so, you want to avoid any unnecessary, unnecessary fillers. You want to be concise and clear in your writing. You want to use language, or sorry, descriptive specific language in the sense that you want to tell your reader exactly what you're doing. You don't want to use, um, you know, shy away from the word very. A lot of people find that that's unhelpful and just a filler. And you want to use the vocabulary of the field. So if you are in a, a biological field, your language and your vocabulary may be different than if you're in a sociological field. 
something was done to some to someone I don't like I picked up the book it's active I am a subject I'm doing something active versus the book was picked up by mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. so it's often clearer to use active voice um, because I guess it is hard to explain yeah um, but it generally it's, it's more clear Henry yeah. you have a thought the way, the way I tell it to my students is if you can add by zombies the end of the clause, then it would be <laughs> passive voice. You say, I close the door, that's active. The, the door was closed by zombies, that's passive. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. 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 And one thing I've learned with active and passive, kind of if you have instructions, if it's in the passive, it makes it seem like you're not in control of what happens. It'll just say like the power cord will be damaged if you do something versus if you pick it up and put it near water, it'll be damaged. So it's kind of, it takes the responsibility out of it if you use passive, and you want to be in the paper. So would it be like in your results section of your research, you say, I conducted a survey of you know, Carteret County residents, as opposed to the survey results show that passive, or yeah. what do you want to use? I don't understand. Well, so it's going to depend, first of all, if you can use that first person or versus mm -hmm. third person. So anytime you say I, that would be first person. Generally, that's less formal, but it's going to depend on the particular research that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say you were allowed to use first person, then certainly you could say I found blah, blah, blah through the survey. Um, so you better to if, say the survey found. If that would be third person, then when you're taking mm -hmm. the personal, the I, you, we out mm -hmm. of it, then you can say the survey showed. So can you can you speak in third person with an active voice? Does that go together or is that separate? It, it does go together. So that example, like the survey results show that that is actually third person because it's the survey is the subject and um, and active because the survey results are doing something there. Exactly. Even if it wasn't person. done doing it, no. right? It, I mean, it would be very awkward to say six. Um, I'm trying to think of how you would word that in passive voice. <laughs> well, you could say something like, you know, seven people died as a result of was shown, but died as a result of smoking what was, was shown, shown in, in the, the survey. survey. Right, as opposed to just say survey shows. Survey show, yeah. So it's kind of, I guess, it's uh, language or sentence variety as well. Like, how are you starting your sentences? And one thing with passive and active. For the majority of your papers, you would want to be an active, but with research papers, I think it leans more towards passive, but you'll kind of learn that in your research classes, you'll see examples of articles and what they do, and that will help you figure out what to do. So there you go. Oh, yeah, go I would suggest that, I mean, depending on what your field is, uh, mm -hmm. field of research or your um, field in general, you know, looking at the peer reviews will give you an idea of, I guess, how to convey the language when you do your own paper. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about the, the active and passive type talk, and we're talking about the survey shows or showed. Then it was bringing up tense in my head. I have this tense filter I have to go through. Yeah. Um, so when you say something like, you know, like a thesis or such, you know, do you keep the whole tense all the way through, or do you get to a point and then transition from what you did and now this is the findings and you're in your present tense? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. No. Right. Um, 
There, a lot of, I mean, it depends also in the field. But typically, I've seen that the introduction and the literature view, um, well, the, the introduction is usually future tense. So I will be looking at, this study will be focused on the introduction, or sorry, the literature view is typically present tense. So, or, you know, the research shows, or the research demonstrates. I think you can do past tense or present. It really depends on the journal you're looking at. Um, also, what your professor may want or whatever governing body you're looking at your paper. Um, method. Oh, I'll go back to it. Methods typically is past tense. So um, we use this question to measure satisfaction. Um, and then with results and discussion, I think they're also back. I think they're past tense as well. <coughs> so, so I guess you would be writing your thesis like you completed it, and this is my whole my work. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. But with the introduction, it's typically um, future tense. Sure. It, at least when you are explaining what you intend on doing and what the paper is going to be concerned with. So the methodology will be doing that? It, it truly depends. I've seen it both ways. Mm -hmm. I've seen it where, you know, we gather and, or we survey 27 people, um, that kind of thing, or I think it's typically past. I really think it's a proposal, it's future. It's right, proposal is more future. Of course, by the time you're writing the paper, you publish in a journal or something right. in the semester, you've likely done the research. Mm -hmm. So it literally is in the past. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to represent that in the past. Good discussion. Good wow. Question. These are great questions. And then you also yeah. want to use controlled language. So you want to use, um, you want to be careful what the conventions are of the particular discipline. So, like I was saying, what does, how does your discipline want you to use the tenses? For example, I think different disciplines may differ on that. Um, you also, kind of going back, you want to use the vocabulary of the discipline. So, um, you know, certain disciplines may use more active language versus. I guess certain disciplines will use more passive language. And then, as we all know, you want to revise, proofread, and edit. If you are spending this much time working on a paper, you really want to make sure that what you hand in at the end of the day has been thoroughly screened and thoroughly read through. And you can always bring it to the Writing Center if you would like any help with that. All right, so any other questions before we go into research? Yeah, I do not. Sorry. Yeah. Let's do Red Bulls. Sorry. <laughs> um, proofreading, just because you ended on proofreading, like, yeah. if, if I wrote my whatever paper, you know, just a 15 page APA, do you guys proofread, like, to look at it, say, for wording, like, the whole thing, or just give suggestions for the right sort of say, hey, this kind of looks see. We could not take your paper and look at it on our own. Oh. We would have a session with you where we either read the paper or we read it, or you read it to us, mm -hmm. and we look at the parts that you want to look at okay. so we can kind of work together. Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very collaborative effort. Um, we definitely are hands-on, but we want the person that we're consulting with to have a say and to put in their opinion. And um, a lot of times it's really helpful for us if you say this particular paragraph, I just really, I'm struggling with it. I don't know if the word choice is accurate. I don't know if there's flow. I don't know if I use transitions well. I don't know if I cite well. Um, but it also differs a little bit, I think, on the consultant as well. Um, if, you know, your familiarity with the subject um, that kind of thing, how much time you have, how long the paper is, that can impact your consultation as well. And I'm a grad student, but I've actually used Writing Center Services for some of my papers. And what's good is they don't think you're stupid. So when you go there, yeah, when you go there, they're very flexible with what you want to look at. So if you, if you feel good about the overall paper and you just don't feel good about the design, they'll help you with that. Yeah, we really tailor it to what your concerns are. And when you, we'll show you um, towards the end of the presentation how you can register for an appointment with us. And you specifically write what you are struggling with in, in the paper and what you would like to look at. 
zero in on. Okay, so now that you know about writing, we're going to talk about how research, all that you learn from your other kind of sessions, goes into this. So the first thing with research that you want to know is you have to check the quality of these sources that you use for your paper. And this is really important because you can choose a bad source, even an article, if you don't check the author. Because um, one time I was writing a paper for a class, and it was on reflections, writing reflections, and I chose an article, and I thought it was really good, it was long, it had a lot of information, and then I found out that the author that wrote it had been blacklisted. So his theories and ideas in the paper had been disproved, and he had copied a lot of a lot of information from someone else. So it's very important to check your sources and that information. So here's a checklist. <coughs> And we've also included this on that blue sheet paper. So I won't go too that. But when you're checking uh, a journal article, the four important things to pay attention to are the author, <coughs> the date, the publication source, and the publisher. And these are kind of questions that you can answer yes or no to. So you want to generally answer yes to all of these. If it's yes and no, I would kind of reconsider using that source, except for the date, because it's good to choose an article at least five years old, so one to five years. But you can choose a later article, like 10 years ago, if it's reputable, if it's been cited a lot, and if it has good information for your topic. Thank you. All right, so then we're going to move on to citation styles. Um, as graduate students, as you've done undergrad, you're probably familiar with MLA in your English classes and maybe Chicago. So when you get to graduate school, a lot of what you'll be using is APA. So these, there are other kind of citation styles, but these are the three main ones. So what we've done is uh, linked to this website on the Purdue Isle that shows how they compare to each other. Okay. We'll be emailing the links out to you mm -hmm. on the following the presentation. And maybe it'll work. Okay. Yeah, we'll yeah, Purdue Isle. Yeah. I'll just go back. Oh, but... I know what they're doing. Um, but refreshing. basically, what that link does is it'll show you APA beside MLA <coughs> beside Chicago, and it'll show you what the differences <coughs> are, how you say your author in Chicago, how you say your author in APA, and how you say your author in MLA. professor, especially mm -hmm. if you're writing for a course, even they may have a particular preference for a citation style. If you're writing professionally for publication, um, then you'll want to follow whatever the journal is asking you to do. Uh, even my experience as an English major, mostly I've been writing in MLA, but there's some journals even in the field of English that require APA. So it may vary depending on who your audience is. Uh, so checking with those audiences is probably <coughs> ideal. Usually there's a standard for each discipline, so you can probably figure out that out and use that most often, and then so just be aware of others. I asked my academic advisor, and he said um, he wasn't sure graduate school had a particular style that oh, as a that way, um, you know, course that they had to follow, or he said just look in the, um, the AAG, the Annals of, of Geography, and, and follow whatever style mm -hmm. they use. Yeah. But I mean, so does the graduate school have a certain... It depends what your... If you teach your major, like I'm an English major, but um, my concentration is within English, so it's technical and professional communication, and generally for those classes I use APA. And it'll usually say on your syllabus or on the assignment. Or your professor will tell you. I'm saying just for your thesis, for your actual research. Um, that would depend on your field as well. 
but you can maybe there's theses written in MLA and APA in Chicago. It solely depends on what department you're a part of. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are thesis requirements for the graduate school as a whole, um, but then individual citation style will vary. They're looking for you to use a citation style for sure from the graduate school. So using it accurately is important, but knowing so which one is. Know, someone in my department should know which. Right, yeah, yeah. Is your, I wonder if the academic advisor is within the department specifically. Um, I would maybe ask the department chair. Mm -hmm. All right, so I bet you guys are ready to stop learning for a little bit. And we're going to have an activity that you can do. So, all right, so if you have a piece of paper, we've given you uh, what APA citation looks like from the Purdue OWL, kind of how to frame it. And then we have the information to put in. So, you guys can just take like five minutes and try this. You might be able to see a little better, maybe, on the individual mm -hmm. screen. Let me yeah. see that. Yeah, Does it zoom in anymore? I don't think so. Yeah, just, uh, yeah. No, go back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you have to Yeah. Okay. Are we going to 5 Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're almost done. Yeah, we have, I think, equations and then the learning center stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we should be okay. I'll try to keep mine pretty short. Um, we may not do the activity full out. Yeah, it's not really so quickly. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm glad when they ask questions because mm -hmm. that's yeah. the most beneficial. Yeah. Can I get more engaged? Yeah, right. Because well, they really want to know. You guys might have heard about various citation generators, which I think we'll show you a list of some. Um, and what we've noticed is that they're not always 100% accurate, which is why it can be beneficial to know how to write out the citations by hand, which is essentially what you're doing right now. Um, or at least to go back and double check them against a citation manual uh, for APA, MLA, Chicago, whatever it is, or that Purdue Owl. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's coming really quickly. I think she needs to get him like one more minute. Give it about one more minute. <laughs> Yeah, want to get them more comfortable, I think, with asking questions mm -hmm. if they're speaking. And I know listen to that. Yeah, that we care about what they have to say. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to have, you may or may not be done, but um, for the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and reveal what it should look like. Big reveal here. <laughs> so this is, this is how that information should have been formatted in APA style. So how many got it right? Is there an indent somewhere in there? Yeah, that's about it. Typically, the second line is indented, and they're often in, um, they're double-spaced. Yeah. Okay, and don't worry if you don't get it right right away, because there are kind of these little things like parentheses and periods and italicizing that it takes a while to learn. But good job, glad you guys like, did that. And then, as Erin was mentioning, there are um, citation generators, which can be extremely helpful. In particular, I use Son of Citation Machine, and when someone comes in for a consultation and is confused on how to uh, format a citation, I will typically send them to Son of Citation Machine. But the caution is that sometimes these uh, citation <coughs> generators, 
ignore or forget punctuation, so a period or a comma, or they will not italicize something that needs to be italicized. Um, our final topic, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, when you are writing the title of the article that you're using, mm -hmm. are you supposed to capitalize every letter of your title, or are you supposed to keep just the first word? Depends. It's first, uh, for an article, it's the title and the first word is capitalized. Everything else is lowercase, unless you have a colon after, and then you capitalize the first uh, word there, too. But that's and APA, APA specific, APA. yeah. In MLA, yes, they capitalize the first letter of each word, major word of the title. So they wouldn't capitalize little words like the, a, and of, unless the first word of the title. And so it's just question? kind of very. I was going to say, just for the, the citation machine, I, I always tell, because well, I teach composition, freshman composition, I tell my students, I said, you realize that you're depending on somebody else's programming ability to mm -hmm. make sure that they're scripting that stuff correctly, and mm -hmm. the grade will be affected if, mm -hmm. if stuff is screwed up. They'll, they'll put in information they don't need, mm -hmm. like uh, extra. Like so ND, there's no date. Mm -hmm. Volume numbers in rears and multiple places will show up because they've overloaded the information. So. Mm -hmm. That's a yeah. great point. This might be a silly question, but um, I'm, um, I'm old school, so I'm not used to the citation generators and things. Can you please tell me why um, they are so convoluted and so often incorrect? When my students ask about even easy them, I said, do yourself a favor and do it manually. As difficult that is to conceptualize, do it manually, learn the correct way, you know, and then if you, you know, when you're going to study, if it's applicable in some, Way or appropriate, then you know. Um, I don't exactly know why they're incorrect, but even I use Google Scholar. Okay. So if I want to do like an article citation, I just go to, I type an article, I push cite, and it cites it for me. But sometimes it won't say the like where I got it from, so it won't say retrieved from this place, or it won't, um, it'll, it won't capitalize the title for some reason. Don't trust them at all. So it's not, yeah, but it gets it done quicker, so yeah. it'll save you time, and then you can just kind of check it against what it really I is. I kind of think of it like Wikipedia. We don't want yeah. our students, or we don't want to type Wikipedia in our writing, but it could be a good starting place to get us some ideas. And sometimes those Wikipedia articles do cite legitimate sources at the bottom. You know, so then we can go to those sources and actually maybe use those in our research. Uh, same thing, kind of citation generators. It might help us get started, which is why the plug to be sure to double check. Mm -hmm. uh, Any questions? I wasn't paying attention, honestly. <laughs> and so you got me excited, and I'm like, oh, I'm lost. What are you talking about? I, I think that's what I was. Uh, okay, but um, if you signed in, we'll email you guys the presentation so you can get it later. So you have access to it. Okay. Okay, so now we're moving on to Aaron and plagiarism. So we've talked about writing, and we've talked about research, and of course, an important part of research is preventing plagiarism. ECU has very strict and serious policies related to this, so we want to make sure that we follow them, uh, especially as graduate students, because not only are we writing for school, but we're now representatives and a part of an academic community within our field. Um, so to define plagiarism, this comes from the ECU handbook. Copying the language, structure, ideas, and or thoughts of another and adopting the same as one's own original work. So that's a pretty broad definition, uh, but we can look at some particular types. Plagiarism does come from the word kidnapping, uh, so it really is literary and intellectual theft or <coughs> kidnapping, uh, which is why we've got this image here that we're stealing. Um, somebody else's child, their mind child, we might think of it. So. Particularly then, there's a couple different types. Some obvious examples would be copying an entire paper, downloading it or purchasing one from the internet, uh, or taking it from another student or a past student. Copying large sections of text, so copying and pasting things from the internet or from articles without a proper citation. Copying text with only slight changes, so maybe we make an attempt to paraphrase, to alter it, to make it our own. Uh, but if we don't make significant changes to the wording and the sentence structure, that would still be considered plagiarism. Missing or inaccurate citations. If we don't cite something at all, we don't give that credit, uh, or if we do it inaccurately, that can be plagiarism as well. 
There's some not as obvious examples for things to think about as you're incorporating research into your writing. Building on someone else's ideas without citing the source. So maybe you got this cool idea from an article and you're not quoting or using any of their particular phrasing, but then you're building on that idea and writing about it in your own words. But we still have to acknowledge where that in initial thought came from. Using words too closely when paraphrasing. Paraphrasing really is a fine art form, um, so we have to make sure it's distinctive if we're going to paraphrase rather than simply quote. Misrepresenting ideas, so if we inaccurately understand what an author said and we're trying to explain it in our own words and it's inaccurate, that would be considered plagiarism. And then even self-plagiarism. If you wrote a paper in the past, technically you cannot use that same information or the same uh, writing or a particular paragraph in a future paper um, without permission. You might ask an instructor, maybe you've written on a topic before and you, used, you want to use one of the same research materials. Maybe that's okay, and some of the ideas or writing related to that source could be incorporated in the new paper if it's going to help you go in a new direction. Um, but generally, especially as students, you're expected to do new work, new writing for each new assignment that you have. Yeah. How do you cite yourself? How do you what? Cite yourself? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, it's going to depend on what you are citing from. If it's an actual paper you wrote that was published, you would cite it as any other published work. Um, if it's something that was not published, they're likely, I know in MLA there's a way to cite all sorts of different types of sources. So even unpublished works can be cited. I imagine there's similar things in APA or Chicago. Uh, that's much, much more rare. So I would say to look that up for the specific guidelines for the citations to have. I must say that our website has uh, various examples of okay. how to cite depending on where you get that source from. Like okay. if it's online, if it's from a magazine, you know, a book, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yes, mm -hmm. and I bet they have an example too of citing an unpublished work, which would essentially be a paper you've written in another course. So there is a way to do that. You may even just be able to reference it personally um, without giving a formal citation, but that's going to depend um, on your teacher. And I wouldn't do that probably in a professional publication. Okay, so like I said, ECU has very specific policies about it. So just so that you're aware of those procedures, a faculty member should notify a student first if they suspect a violation and request a meeting. The student responds to that notification, the meeting occurs, and the faculty member ultimately determines the outcome of that initial meeting. These outcomes range um, from a failing grade on that particular assignment, failing the course overall, or even expulsion from the university. Moreover, like we said, as graduate students, not only are you students, you're a member of an academic professional community, so you can lose credibility or integrity within that community. So it's a serious thing. We want to make sure then that we avoid plagiarism. So the key then is to always give credit where credit is due, and there's three ways that you can incorporate research into your writing. Quotation, paraphrase, and summary. Quotation, um, we might think of it at the most readily. It's the easiest way often. We do have to figure out the particulars of how it should be cited. Um, but it's easy. You just copy the words from somebody else and make sure you use quotation marks and give credit. However, quotation should only be about 10 to 15% of your writing. So the vast majority of your writing should be your own words. Now that's not to say that only 10 to 15 percent of your paper would be research-based. Certainly you can incorporate more research than just 10 to 15 percent, um, but that's where it might take the place of paraphrase or summary to draw upon those. The reason why quotation, we're going to stay on that one for a little while, <laughs> the reason why quotation is um, pretty minimal is because as uh, professionals in, in whatever your respective field is, and that includes graduate students, we are responsible for making sure we understand what we read in the research and to demonstrate that understanding in our writing, which is where paraphrase and summary can really come in handy. There's no percentages that I have uh, for paraphrase and summary that's really open to use as much as you want. Uh, you just want to make sure that you're doing it accurately. So summary would be looking at, let's say you read a book chapter, and there's nothing specific, a quote or a particular part you want to use, but the idea as a whole is useful to you then maybe you summarize that whole chapter in one paragraph and relate it to your research. Whereas paraphrase would just be more specific. Uh, if there's particular ideas that an author discusses in a single sentence or paragraph, a couple of paragraphs, that's where you could maybe paraphrase. 
quotation you want to use when it's written so well, so beautifully, or so specifically, the information is so specific, like numbers, that it's hard to recreate it. Otherwise, if it's just a good idea, but there's nothing particularly striking about it, you want to paraphrase it, which means to put it in your own words, but still give <coughs> credit that the idea came from the research. So paraphrase requires that we change the wording as well as the sentence structure. So instead of simply saying, I walked home after the meeting, um, I probably couldn't use the words walked, meeting, home. I'd need to come up with different words for that, as well as rearrange it. After the meeting, I walked home. But again, we use different words. So we'll practice this in just a second as well. Thank you. So you slide all three, though? You, slide you do. Mm -hmm. Yes. So quotation is going to use, of course, quotation marks, as well as the citation, because the idea and the words came from them. Paraphrase, no quotation marks for the citation, because the idea came from research. Summary, same thing, no quotation marks, but the idea came from research, so it should be cited. Yeah. You don't need to credit or cite these types of things. Your own experiences, your own observations, your own opinions, generally accepted facts or common knowledge. Uh, certainly there's common knowledge just generally, but there may also be common knowledge within your field. Okay, so if it's a generally accepted fact within your field or discipline, uh, then you don't necessarily have to cite those either, depending on who your audience is. If your audience is generally familiar with the idea, then you don't necessarily have to cite it. If in doubt, go ahead and cite something. Definitely better to oversight than to undersight um, and have potential for plagiarism. Want to know why that one's blank? <laughs> okay. So now we're going to do a little bit of practice. I know we're running short on time. Um, so I'm going to pass these out, and you can start practicing while we're also going to talk through our um, using the and how you can use it. These are just chocolates, they're no chocolates, so if you're allergic or you don't want one, that's fine, you don't have to take one. What's special about Dove is not only is it really good, but on the wrapper, there is a little inspirational quote or saying from Dove. So you can practice this. You can pretend Dove is the author, and um, you can use the the phrase inside to write it as a quotation. They also try to paraphrase it. You know, they might say things like, be your best self today. How would you paraphrase that? It is important to strive for perfection and be who you are. So we also have a location at the Health Sciences Campus. Um, I, I work at both locations, and the Health Sciences Campus is um, by the hospital. So if you're ever over there and need help, we have a, a location there as well. Great. So what do we do? We talked about a little bit about this during the presentation. Um, to elaborate just a little bit more, we can help you at any stage of the writing process, whether you're coming up, if you're struggling coming up with a topic, if you have to write an outline for that topic, that paper, or if you're in the revision editing phase of your draft. So at the Writing Center, there are a combination of grad students and undergrad students, and um, we are from all different disciplines. And in our bio, I think most of them say whether or not you're a grad student or an undergraduate student. So if you would prefer to work with one over the other, that's an option for you. Um, all of our consultants are very qualified and have definitely different strengths. Okay, so we're going to 
Now, to note on that, every time I've made a university writing appointment, I've actually worked with an undergrad, mm -hmm. not a grad student. And here are ours. Um, if you got a bookmark, then they're there too. And then um, this is the website to make an appointment. And we can go ahead and pull it up. What is not required, but they are recommended. They have gotten busier in the last couple of weeks. Um, so if you could make an appointment, great. Um, if not, feel free to walk in and see if some of it's available. And if you've never been to the Writing Center before and do want to make an appointment so that we can set aside <coughs> some time for you, you're going to want to go ahead and register first. And then once you've completed the registration, which is some information about um, your name, what you're studying, what you would like some help with, you're going to go ahead and log in. If anybody wants to stay after to get help with registering or having an appointment, we'll be glad mm -hmm. to do that. If you want to run your quotation or paraphrase by me from your desk talk list, I'd be glad to hear that as well. All right, do you have any other questions about presentation or about the <laughs> Yeah, I want to know so why do you have to do so much more writing in, in grad school than you do in undergrad? I never heard, I heard our answers. Is there like a. They're all correct. Oh, yeah, they're all correct. <coughs> because your teacher says that? No. Yeah. I pretty much thought it was because we don't have enough to do already. <laughs> That's probably it. I think it's the expectation that you're advancing and you're now a professional in the academic community in addition to being a student. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We'll be glad we're going to be in the question. Thank you. 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 I wasn't. Okay, because I was in there with We had a class. Letitia Bourne. She's CDFR. Yes, that's insane. Yeah. We have a we have a course with her. Yeah, we have yeah, a teacher's okay, so with her. Who was there? Okay, yeah, I was wondering who was there. No, no, I wanted to go, but we had a class right before.